If you could somehow create a scatter plot of dreams that American kids have for their futures, there would be big old blots on flying rockets and on racing cars. There might be a couple of dots on saving the world as well. But along the way, as those kids grow up, practicality takes a big chunk out of that wonder. Dreams change to reality, and most of us find ourselves on more grounded pedestrian career paths. Not, however, Elon Musk. Musk grew up in South Africa. He came to America, built a couple of companies. PayPal was one of them. And instead of taking the millions he made and skipping off to a private island someplace, he jumped into two of the riskiest ventures on the planet at pretty much the same time. And somehow, against the odds, it seems to be working out for him. I spoke to him a couple of years ago in Hawthorne here in Los Angeles at the headquarters of SpaceX. But this time, it was all about Tesla, fresh off the release of the electric car company's brand new SUV crossover called the Model X. We went up to Fremont, California to tour Tesla's plant, a giant place people riding bikes to get around, giant red robot arms welding and sparking all over the place. And the robot arms come to life. Oh, man. A metal stamping machine the size of a four-story building. It is kind of an assembly line wonderland in here. It is straight up a heavy industrial operation for which expectations are high. So on today's installment of Conversations from the Corner Office, the guy in charge. We're expecting you. Won't you have a seat? Ready to go to work? Elon Musk, welcome to the program. Uh, thanks for having me. A thousand cars a week, right? Is that what you make here? Plus or minus? Uh, approximately. Yeah. Is this where you thought you'd be? I mean, it really depends when you say what, what. Five years ago. Five years ago. Five years ago, I think I, I would have probably thought that we would have been here. Um, but um, if you asked me at the beginning of Tesla, would I have thought that we'd be here? I would have said no. I thought we'd most likely not succeed. I thought we'd most likely die. I, I'm pausing here just because that's an interesting thing for a guy running a big company like this to say. Uh, well, of course. I mean, the track record for car company startups is extremely poor. Um, in fact, the only car companies in the U.S. that have not gone bankrupt um, are currently Ford and Tesla, like GM and Chrysler. Went yeah, bankrupt. yeah, no, I was uh, there. I remember that. Yeah. So, um, you know, if the car companies say that we're just, just us and Ford that, that are, um, yeah. So what's your worst nightmare then with this company? I mean, what do you think could sink you? Gas at, at you know, a dollar a gallon, oil at 20 bucks a barrel? What, what could do you in? Well, I'm going to be clear that um, my, my, my view at the start of Tesla is not my view today. A- absolutely. So I agree with that. It's very different because, but, but as you, you know, think it's sort of like, like, you know, your, your probability of existence when you're a tadpole is much lower than when you're a frog. Um, yes. I thought they were a frog, but um, the... But yeah, I mean, in, in the beginning it was very, very risky. Now I think, um, I think we're in pretty good shape. Um, we've got a car that was rated as the best car ever by Consumer yep. Reports. Be- better than the best car ever. I mean, you yeah, broke the scale. Change the scale exactly. Right. Um, we've got the uh, all-wheel drive Model S now in production. I believe mm-hmm. you drove the um, the version of the seventy kilowatt yes. that you drove yes. was the, the, the dual drive. motor all-wheel yep. drive. It's actually the best all-wheel drive. Uh, of, of any car because it's got the it's got um, a motor in the front and motor in the back. Also, it went like a zillion miles an hour. I mean, yeah, it's, you know. it's very it's like very fast, but it's got better traction control than any gasoline uh, all wheel drive because it's got digital uh, control between the front and rear. So y- instead of having a just a mechanical shaft, uh, y- it the the computer can adjust uh, power to the front and rear at the millisecond level, um, and so it's got much more responsiveness than a, than a gasoline all wheel drive, which is mechanically linked. I still want to know what's your worst nightmare about this company. If if oil goes to twenty dollars a barrel, or if I don't even know what what keeps you up at night running this company. Um, actually, to be honest, I, I don't get kept up at night uh, too much these no, days. No, come on. Uh, no, um, I. I mean, I'm, I'm up at night, but not sort of uh, you know working certainly, uh, but not uh, sort of stressing super hard about the future. I mean, th- we, we have the Model X that we've got to yep. obviously ramp up the production of. We've got a complete development of the Model 3. We've got the battery pack business, the you know, power wall, power yeah. pack. Um, and um, yes, there's a, lot of thing, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but um, I feel at this point that like Tesla's in a pretty solid position. Um, and uh, you know, it's a question of how quickly can we bring an affordable 
car, electric car to market? Uh, how quickly can we bring um, affordable battery storage to market? Um, but um, but I think at this point Tesla's in a in a pretty solid position. I wonder whether the thing you're trying to do with this company isn't really make these awesome electric cars, but rather change the way we store energy in this society today, which is the energy problem of our lifetime. Is that a fair characterization of what you're trying to do? Yeah, this, I mean, what, what, what I'm trying to do is, is help solve the sustainable energy problem in general. So in order for us to have a truly sustainable future, we've got to have sustainable energy generation, which I think will come primarily from solar panels um, and wind and some hydroelectric and uh, geothermal and, and a few other things. Um, and then uh, you've got to be able to store that energy because the sun only shines during the day, the wind doesn't blow all the time. So you've got to be able to store that energy. That's why the stationary battery packs are very important. And then you've got to consume that energy in a sustainable way, which is why electric transport is important. Now, if you've got solar panels, uh, batteries, and uh, electric cars, you have a complete solution, which is very exciting. Um, and then, of course, we you know we recycle the battery packs; they're non-toxic. So it really is a complete um, and true solution for the the future as far as sustainable energy is concerned. Why cars and not I don't know, like airplanes or or something else? I mean, rockets are a whole different thing. Yes, ro- I mean, ro- yes, ro- <laughs> rockets, rockets are a whole. You can't go electric, thing. unfortunately. Um, but uh, aircraft and ships, and uh, you know, all, all other forms of transport will go fully electric. Not not half electric, but fully electric. Um, you're, you're convinced? Oh, no question. Of course, um, the electric is fundamentally more efficient than um, an, any any kind of combustion engine vehicle, uh, because in a combustion engine vehicle, most of that energy is going into heat. Um, so a typical uh, gasoline car engine uh, will be maybe 20% efficient. Um, and so it's 80% of it is heat because it's a fire. It's like a, you have right. a, conti- a series of, of explosions occurring in your engine that push cylinders down um, and generate a huge amount of heat. So, so it's, it's very inefficient. Um, and, and, of course, it, it generates uh, CO2 and nitrous oxide and uh, sulfur oxides and um, other bad things that are that negatively affect our health. So, you, you, you know, you, you really want to uh, go with an electric car because an electric car um, is, like an electric motor, is typically about 90% efficient at converting energy into motion. You think about an electric motor, it doesn't generate much heat. A combustion engine generates a lot of heat. Yeah. So, so then if you, and if, if particularly if you combine it with sustainable electric power generation from a solar panel, um, then, uh, yeah, you've got a great solution. If you weren't doing this, running this company and running SpaceX, what would you be doing? I would be, well, I, would, I do like the idea of an electric aircraft company. I think there's, um, I think one could do a pretty cool supersonic vertical takeoff and landing electric jet. That would be really fun. Um, and There's um, a temptation to say here, come on, you're just making stuff up. No, but I have a design in mind for that. Uh, but I have too many, too many things on my plate to do. Uh, and then, of course, there's the Hyperloop. I'd probably be working on that. Um, yeah, I, I, which I personally am waiting for. Right. And actually, there, there are a couple of companies that are working on commercializing the, the Hyperloop. Um, the former president of Cisco, I believe, just, just joined as CEO of, of one of those companies. So what is it about entrepreneurialism for you? that gets? Because clearly that's what's going on here, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I do think that creating a company to produce a, a product or service that that people love is that's very rewarding, no question. Uh, but um, you know, what I'm trying to do is, uh, I mean, at a broader philosophical level, is I'm trying to minimize existential risk in the future. That's what I'm trying to do. So okay, so, so so that gets me to something I've been thinking about. There's a question to put to you that's the Steve Jobs question, and bear with me for a minute, right? You're compared to him every now and then, visionary, transformational companies that you're running. But you always sort of got the sense that Steve Jobs just wanted to sell stuff, right? He didn't want to make cool stuff, but then he wanted to sell it. Mm-hmm. it I wonder if you, with these two companies you're running, whether you want to change energy use in this country in our lifetime, and also, oh, by the way, transport humanity to Mars. 
Yes, absolutely. I mean, that's what I'm trying to do. It's like I said, it's, it's all under the sort of broader philosophical goal of minimizing existential risk. Um, you know, trying to essentially trying to make the future good. Um, and uh, but um, yeah, that's that's my goal. Uh, try to be as helpful as possible in that direction. Um, and uh, think yeah, things have worked out a lot better than I expected. I sort of really expected things to not work out actually. So, do you ever look at the rest of us and, and think we just sort of don't get it sometimes? Um, well, I, I, <laughs> um, I think people get it when, I mean, I'm not sure what you're referring to get to, to getting, but well, th uh, this whole idea that you clearly are spending your life doing, which is minimizing existential risk. I, I think minimizing, minimizing existential risk is a sort of is a fairly sensible thing to work on, um, and generally, when if I explain it to people, then they agree that it is. Uh, I mean. Because because what's the counterpoint? No, <laughs> right, don't waste exactly. your time. On <laughs> exactly, no, make the future bad. I yeah, mean, like, yeah. Um, but I, I and I think um, really, uh, you know, I mean, it's, any company like like that that's making a like a product or service that that the rest of um, humanity finds useful, or some portion of of the of a fellow humans being find useful, is it, that's a great thing. Like it's if somebody's making. Like a great, you know, you've just you've, uh, a great watch or a, 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 you know, great apparel or, or, or anything. Like if they're making great products that the fellow human beings um, love, I think that's that's awesome. Talk to me for a minute about um, failure, about the value that you put on it, and and how much of it you tolerate in this company. Well, I'm, I, I, and I think like most people, I don't like failure. Uh, but I mean, if, if you don't, uh, if you don't allow for some amount of failure, then you, it's very difficult to innovate. So, I mean, I do expect that that we we, we push hard to innovate, and that, um, and therefore, f some amount of failure must be acceptable. Otherwise, you won't be able to, you know, explore new territory. So, all right. So let's l let me ask you. A, a a more specific question. So the the uh, Falcon Wing doors on the Model X. First of all, was that your idea or, or one of your engineers' ideas? Um, well, I can give you the uh, the origin of the Falcon Wing door. I'm th like it's sort of a group idea. I'm not sure. Okay. I mean, I I, I mean it might have been I, mine. I th I think it was mine, but I think others had you know maybe. Okay, had, so so that's ideas that, too. that's a huge selling point um, for this car, right? I think you know. Actually, the, the the funny thing is, I think for the Model X, some people at first won't like the. Some people will buy the car in spite of the Falcon Wing doors, and some will buy. Well, yeah, that's yeah. And some will buy it because of the Falcon Wing doors. But once they get the car, I think almost everyone will will like the doors. So the question is, how many iterations, how many failures did you have in what is really a, a sort of a breakthrough kind of thing? Yeah. Um, Quite a few failures, actually. We tried uh, several iterations on the door, and I'll tell you what we were trying to achieve. Um, so, like, wh why, why did we make the door at all? Because we could have just gone with a regular door that opens normally with yeah. a, with a you know vertical hinge. And what we're trying to achieve is how do we how do we achieve how do you directly access the third row? How can you step directly to the third row um, while still having um, child seats or, or 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 kids sitting in the second row? Like like very often if you've got um, it, or almost any other car that I'm aware of, uh, if you have child seats in the second row, right, it's, it's all over. You can't get to the third row. Um, and right. I experienced this personally when I got you, to... You and me both, pal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think like a lot of parents have experienced this. And um, and so, so then you're like, wow, I've got this big SUV, but I can't use uh, a, lot, a large portion of it. And, um, and then also the storage space ended up being quite limited. If you had mm. all three rows up, then the, the trunk was tiny. Um, and so we wanted to, to fix those those things, and and but so in order to do that, you have to have a big opening. Now th there are really uh, only two ways to have a big opening. Really, you could have um, a sliding door, but a sliding door, in a, like in a minivan, that's that's pretty good accessibility, but it constrains the uh, external geometry, so it, it makes it planar along the side, and and that's what makes it look not very good generally. Like it's the, it really hurts the aesthetics to have. A, a planar geometry along the side of the, the the car, and and then you've got to support the sliding door with with um, a, with with three pins with and hinges so and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. and and then the, the th three pins 
uh, you know, he, that creates sort of like a, a gash along the side of the, yep. ca the car, which doesn't look good either. Um, so, so then in order to have um, complex curvature and, and actually may have the car look good, you can't make it slide. So then you've got to open it in some way. Then, but a traditional gullowing door only has one hinge, and so it, it opens up too far outward and too far up. Um, and so the way that we solved this was by putting a second hinge um, and thus calling it a gullwing door, not a, oh, sorry, a falcon, falcon, door, falcon yeah. wing door instead of a gullwing door, because um, it's, got, it's two, got two independently actuating hinges. Right. And it opens up, and, and it opens up instead of outward. Um, and, it, and it's able to uh, assess the distance to other cars, look at the distance to the garage roof, and optimize the opening space um, so it, w it won't hit your garage roof. It won't hit um, anyone's there. And, 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 and I'll tell you, it's amazing. And we'll have, we'll have a, a video of it on the website, a video okay. of, your, of your rollout thing, because it's, it's extraordinary. But how many times did you send your guys back to the drawing board, your, your men and your women, and say, you know what, not good enough? Well, the, the, Five, the general concept... Eight, ten? Twenty? Uh, <laughs> um, Actually, I mean, the biggest challenge we had with the, the Falcon doors was the actuators. Uh, so, you know... To whether we ha we should have hydraulic actuators or um, uh, electric Electrical, yeah. electric actuators, and the we started off with hydraulic actuators, but we weren't able to get a level of precision, um, huh. and 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 really have it. We wanted the opening arc to be beautiful and precise, um, and to have good force feedback on so that if if you did hit something, it would detect the force right, and, and then stop, stop immediately. Um, and it was a lot harder to do that with with hydraulic actuators than with um, with uh, with electric actuators, and uh, and then the hydraulic was more sensitive to changes in temperature. So if it was very cold. You get higher viscosity in the hydraulic fluid, um, and so you'd ha have more variability in the door opening. Um, whereas with the electric actuators, um, this it it really works well in very cold or hot temperatures, um, and. The level of precision we're able to achieve is is so great that we like we could s you could sign my name with those actuators. <laughs> Not that anybody would ever do yeah. that. Uh, which part of your job do you enjoy more? Getting out there with the engineers and getting your hands dirty, or and I know the answer to this question before I ask it, or sitting in boring management meetings where you have to figure out the HR policy for for this <laughs> company. Um, yeah, I, well, you, I mean you default to engineering. It's it's yeah. Clear I mean uh, engineering and design is. You know, actually, engineering design is what I actually do spend most of my time on. Um, so, um, only um, I mean, right now, about maybe three percent of my time is spent on things like, say, interviews and, and media yeah. and that kind of thing. I think sometimes people think it's a lot more than that, uh, but it's only, you know, maybe, uh, you know, and like a, a, yeah, like not even less than three percent, probably because it's less than a few hours per. Per week. This is so funny. I can see you actually doing the calculations now. I mean, you're 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 more comfortable in that realm of quantified stuff. Um, yeah, I like engineering. I also like design aesthetics, yeah. um, and um, I, you know, I like creating um, products that people are going to love. I mean, it like really gets me fired up when somebody buys the car and they lo and they love it. Yeah, you know, um, it's been a big couple of weeks for you uh, with the rollout of the Model X and and the the presentation. I wonder if you worry about this company and yourself being overexposed. Um, yeah, I think probably um, we are overexposed from time to time. It, that, I mean, that's um, not the reason I'm going. I'm going I'm to be reducing my, my media activity uh, to more like 1% instead of maybe 3 or 4%. Um, so... Uh, but mostly because I just need I need more time to focus on on actually building the products, um, and and uh, yeah, and I, too much exposure isn't good. Well, so I, I I can't you know talking about you and having more time I can't be the first one who's pointed out to you, look Elon, you have really capable people working for you at SpaceX, you have really capable people working for you at Tesla, you don't have to be running both companies, man. Any thought of that? Well, I think in in I mean in the in the uh, long term, I'm I'm sure I won't be running either company because I'll be, you know, retired or or dead or something, you know. So, yeah, but you're what 45? <laughs> you got a ways to go yet. Yeah. Um, oh, so all right. So here's a better question: What would it take for you to stop day-to-day -day management of either one of these companies? 
and and I acknowledge it. You know, Tesla's publicly traded, and you're talking to investors and all that stuff, and I get that. But yeah, as he looks up at me with a with a with a wry smile, <laughs> but um, I, I I expect to be with SpaceX and Tesla for as long into the future as I can imagine. What's the worst part of your job? Um, I mean, sometimes there are difficult personnel issues, and you have to deal with, um, uh, you know, like lawsuits, and you know, yeah. like you know, the, the, like a natural state of any public company in particular is you get sued a lot. Um, so you know, dealing with um, sort of like the negative stuff is obviously not fun. Um, doing doing creative work is a lot more fulfilling. Uh, I want to talk briefly about the Gigafactory, the plant you're building out in Nevada that's going to build a bazillion batteries a year. I mean, it's like 500,000, whatever it is, right? Yeah, actually, we, uh, yeah, 500,000 cars per year of, of batteries plus... Car cars worth of batteries per year. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's a, lot, it's a lot of batteries. It's a lot of batteries. And, uh, and it is, in, yeah. in point, isn't it more batteries than, like, the world produces right now? Yes. The, okay. The, the Gigafactory that we're building uh, is designed to have a capacity greater than... Um, the sum of all lithium-ion batteries for all purposes in the world today. So okay. the total um, output of lithium-ion batteries for all purposes um, right now is about like maybe 33 gigawatt hours, and the the gigafactories are aiming for 50. 50. So you're kind of betting on the come there that the demand's going to be there for those batteries. You're, yes. You're, you're building into a market that doesn't yet exist. That's correct. Doesn't that make you kind of go, hmm, is this a really good idea? I'm confident it will exist. Um, the I think the demand for the Model Three is going to be very, very good. Um, as it is, we've got you know pretty good demand for the the X and the S. And I think over time, the combined X, S, X and S demand is you know maybe a hundred thousand units a year, or maybe a bit more um, as we mature various markets. Um, and um, and then with the Model Three uh, and 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 various uh, iterations on that platform. I'm, I'm really confident that we can do you know, another three or 400,000 cars per year. Which is still minuscule in the global car universe. Yeah, right? that's yeah. important to bear in mind. Yeah. Like 500,000 cars a year is only uh, like half a percent right. market share. Um, so it's not, you know, we're not saturating the, the, the car market. I, uh, I had a, a conversation with Alan Mulally, the guy who used to run Ford. He was talking to him six or seven years ago, and I said, you know, what would you rather do? Would you rather be, and this was when the car industry was starting to slow down. I said, would you rather be profitable or would you rather be the biggest car company in the world? And he said, profitable in a heartbeat. We'll sell off and we will downsize. The analogous question to you is, uh, would you rather build uh, an electric car that is going to change society or would you rather build market share and be one of the big three automakers? Well, like I said, we are trying to change the the nature of transportation. So, um, so definitely scale matters because more electric cars means more change in the way we um, transport people. Um, so, um, I, I think in the case of Tesla, I would. I mean, hopefully this is this is a, hopefully this is a false dichotomy. Uh, mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. uh, but I you know I suppose I'd rather be uh, a low profitability company. That's larger than a than a small company that's that has higher percentage profitability. But I, I like I said, I think that's probably a false economy. I think ultimately it can be a big company that that is profitable. Um, although obviously we're not profitable today. Last thing, you keep saying Tesla, the rest of us keep saying Tesla. Who's right? Yeah, I think you're both right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>